Okay, well, my name is David Liggett, and I am with Data Center Hawk. So excited today to be joined by uh, Rama Darba, the Director of Solutions Architecture, and Rupa Prabhu, the Director of Engineering with NVIDIA. Uh, thank you so much for joining. It's great to see you again. Thanks for having us, David. It's uh, wonderful that we get to be guests on this uh, podcast with you guys yeah. at Data Center Hawk. Thanks a lot. You bet. So for those that are watching, we, um, we, I had the opportunity to be on uh, NVIDIA's podcast several months ago, uh, and that was such a fun discussion. And so uh, we wanted to um, have them on our podcast to really talk about a number of things that are going on in the data center industry. Um, but before we start, like, Rama, let's just start with you. Tell us about your background um, and, and how you got to be in the position that you're in at NVIDIA. Sure. Uh, so... I started with a company called Cumulus back in 2016, and uh, I, it was a small startup that had about 100 employees when I started that was focused on uh, open networking and this construct that it could bring disaggregation to the networking world um, through the leverage of open standards, open protocols, and a real focus on um, you know, Linux as the core fundamental of the operating of the network operating system uh, environment. Uh, I worked there for about four years and uh, you know in two, June 2020 we officially got acquired and got merged into Nvidia as part of Nvidia's larger data center uh, market strategy and uh, and for the past, you know, two years now, yeah. or a year and a half now, uh, I've been at NVIDIA as a director of solutions architecture, focusing primarily on the networking space and the Ethernet switching environment. That's great. Uh, thank you for that that overview. Um, Ruba, what about you? Tell us about your background. Same story as Rama. I was at Cumulus Networks, uh, which got acquired by NVIDIA last year. And uh, my background has been just Linux systems and um, past almost well 13 years I've been doing networking, core networking, uh, mostly Linux kernel networking. Uh, I've been a Linux kernel developer as well. I've been playing both hats, uh, engineering leadership and architecture. And um, I've always had a systems approach to networking. So Cumulus was a great place. Uh, Cumulus tried to uh, remove the silos, networking silos, right? And have Linux uh, networking boxes and switches and routers as treated as Linux systems. So that was a great, uh, great opportunity. And uh, moving into NVIDIA, that continues. And as you know, NVIDIA is thinking about the old data center as a system. So that plays right well in, yeah. Absolutely. Well, and I'm sure the last two years that y'all have been at your post, it's been very busy. Um, we kind of covered some of that when we were on your podcast, but one of the things I wanted to start with um, in the in the data center world, uh, you know, one of the leading buzzwords in the last, I would say, like five years has been the edge and talking about, um, you know, how this concept is going to change the data center you know, even like the commercial real estate industry from a data center perspective. But, you know, you all are working with companies that are deploying the, these strategies and, and really trying to figure out. So that's so I think it's so interesting from my perspective to hear. I'd love to hear just about like, you know, what are some of like the the different companies or industries that you think will will utilize edge strategy? And Rama, maybe let's start with you. Yeah, uh, I think it's a really great question. So b before we dive into the companies and the specifics, uh, maybe we can just spend a little bit of time defining it because edge is one of those loaded terms, <laughs> right? Uh, like cloud, <laughs> yeah, where sure. it can mean anything to anyone, right? So it's mm -hmm. always nice to start with a, a unified definition, right? Because even for us, you know, uh, when we work on it, it's easy to talk past people that are both talking about edge because they're talking about two different parts of edge, right? So it's a multi-defined term and I would probably break it into four different categories, right? So uh, the first one is probably what is most familiar with people and they would call it the data center edge, right? Um, that one is a data center that's hosted by someone, whether it is owned by the end customer, whether it's hosted at a colo, doesn't really matter, but it's a physically located, um, geographically bound um, data center, right? And its edge functionality is driven by its peering. So whatever it connects to, whether it's an ISP, right? Um, whether it's a cloud service provider, whatever, right? Uh, you're basically connected to someone and that's your edge. 
uh, that's the edge of the network. You uh, might be pushing data to the edge of your data center and a deeper down in the data center, way past the core is where other activities happen. But you know that could be considered one level of edge. Why is that considered edge? Because um, the more peerings you have to different CSPs or ISPs, the closer <laughs> you are to your customers, right? And you just kind of push the burden onto the um, ISP or the CSP at that point, okay? Uh, so that's one. And then that talks about ingress and egress peering. How quickly can people get to you? And how quickly can you get to others? Not geographically, but um, technologically, right? F via routing protocols, via next hops, via peering, okay? So that's one. Uh, the other one that we would, uh, that's probably closely related to that is what we would call say like a retail or on-premises edge, okay? Now this is, again, pretty easy to actualize. So if you are say a big box retailer and you wanna do some more advanced uh, edge computing or AI-based computing uh, for say like um, vendorless or sorry, cashierless checkout, right? Uh, or theft prevention or anything associated with that or like inventory management, right? Uh, for that, you would probably run a small data center, right? Uh, you know, a rack or two of gear in somewhere on in your building, right? Uh, somewhere in your uh, actual store mm -hmm. front, right? Uh, and then for that, that would be considered edge as well. That's a level of edge computing. Now, you have to buy lots of gear and distribute it through all your stores, depending how big you are. But that's that's a form of edge as well, right? Then there's one more a level advanced than that, right? Even more distributed, and we would call that say like the embedded edge. Right. Mm. And that's something more like uh, along the lines of, say, like robotics. Right. And mm. one of the probably the best methods right now, because it's so hype and hot right now, is for self-driving autonomous vehicles and sure. cars. Right. Um, for example, even a self-driving car, you cannot have AI or computational decisions being made in the cloud via real time. There's latency issues. There's computational mm. challenges. There's feedback. You have to have some um, AI capable chip embedded in the car itself. And then all the AI decisions like turns, avoiding pedestrians, stopping yeah. at lights, um, stop and go traffic, all has to be made instantaneously by the vehicle. And that's a form of edge as well, right? And then the last is much more of what I guess would be the way more traditional when we just say edge, what does it look like? It'd be more like the Metro edge or the telco edge, right? You've got hosting providers all over the world, right? That are going to go around and then offer you services. And it's their responsibility to geographically host your service or application in a location that is closest to the customer, right? Mm -hmm. So they'll have uh, uh, data centers all over the world, right? A good example of this is companies like um, Equinix, for example, right? Uh, and they have data centers all over the world that uh, allows us to, you know, uh, or allows them to go ahead and uh, peer up and then deliver content with the lo lowest amount of backhaul, right? So if you're mm -hmm. located in China, you're located in Singapore, Russia, France, US, you're not centralizing your data and traveling all the way to say like San Francisco to get it. Mm -hmm. They're going to distribute that load everywhere, right? So that's kind of the first portion. So depending on what level of edge you're talking about, that's where it is, right? Now, uh, the different markets that are going to consume this are going to be based on their use cases, right? Mm -hmm. So manufacturing and industrials are going to lean way harder into an embedded edge because they have more robotics. They have sure. more, uh, you know, uh, autonomous decision making, right? you got a warehouse that's going to do delivery yeah. robots. you got, yeah, like, yep. you know, a manufacturing line. That's all going to be an embedded edge place. So what does that mean? That means that they're going to take huge amounts of training data and they're going to send all that huge amounts of training data to a central location, okay? And that central location is not going to be an edge. It's going to be a big data center somewhere. Maybe it's going to be on-prem, maybe it's hosted, wherever. And that is going to house a crazy amount of data federation to be able to train and educate the actual AI models that you do. So what's the layout of your factory? What's mm. the, uh, you know, the widgets in your, uh, in your um, system, right? Um, how are they coming in? What parts need to be uh, put in? Inventory management, all the AI learning that needs to be done. 
out of that AI learning will come the actual programming, the, the learned trained mm -hmm. model. That learned trained model is going to get pushed down to the actual endpoints themselves, right? And all the edge decisions are going to be um, made there. A, you know, a, a great example, I was talking to some folks internally here at NVIDIA about that, right? Uh, another good example, so warehousing is, say, for example, in the healthcare space, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, Healthcare, genetics, genomics, it's a big field right now that's really embracing artificial intelligence, but it can't use giant um, you know, centrally isolated data centers for uh, its, um, all its AI and accelerated computing needs anymore. So as a result, you know, uh, an example to give for that is, uh, let's say, talk about genomic sequencing, right? So if we're talking about uh, actual genomic sequencing, the amount of data that's required that initially starts with that uh, genomic sequencing process is probably in the terabytes range, right? Mm. Huge amounts of data. But then once that's all done, an actually fully encoded human genome at the end is only a couple of gigs, right? So that's you're fair. talking about data reduction levels of, you know, in the orders of maybe 90%, right? Yeah. So do you want to have to send 10 times as much data constantly to a centralized so, uh, environment? Or is there any, you know, local or edge computational capability that you can do to reduce that amount of data set so that the actual data transmission and data gravity issues don't, you know, affect you that much? So, you know, market to market, it really depends on the use cases. And I tried to name a couple that um, yeah, no. you know, examples that kind of resonate most commonly in the example, in the you know environments that we interact with. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, I mean, these are the, these are the, the drivers, you know, that's pushing this architecture to be created, you know, the way it is. And, and Ruba, maybe you could share with us, um, you know, Rama said AI a number of times, you know, and, and like this artificial, artificial intelligence, you know, and other, you know, heavy like data technology, how will that, how do you feel like those will impact the data center industry as a whole? Well, AI is computational heavy, data heavy, right? Like uh, the points that uh, Rama brought up, there's lots of data, lots of acceleration, parallel processing, AI is, uh, needs a lot of parallel processing and that's where GPU compute comes in. So high performance, hardware accelerated uh, data center from networks, from DPUs to you know, CPU and GPU are all powering the AI in the data center, right? And to go back to the edge, um, edge is just running AI applications today, like inference, right? You're still doing most, to go, going back to Rama's point again, you're doing most of the training in the data center with uh, the data centric, uh, applications that we have today. And AI at the edge is mostly application oriented doing real-time decisions on power sensitive hardware and so on. And um, the examples that he gave about, uh, about uh, well, traffic and healthcare and all these real-time uh, aut autonomous vehicles, uh, that's where AI at the edge comes in. And again, all data going back to the data center uh, with all the compute elements that we talked about. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I, I think um, I think NVIDIA has a conference, GTC, where, you know, I think maybe just recently where AI was one of the key, um, you know, talking points and, and focuses. What were some of the key takeaways from that, um, that that you can share with us? Yeah, I think at the recent GTC, I would highly encourage people to go and look at Jensen's uh, keynote and some of the great presentations at GTC. But to summarize, I think uh, Omniverse was one of the uh, main highlight, right? It's the metaverse and the conversations around virtual sure. worlds and simulations and digital twins, uh, if you will. So all this is nothing but taking real-time information uh, with capabilities like edge compute and uh, making decisions in real time and, uh, you know, streaming, uh, what is that? Streaming video analytics to mm -hmm. uh, the speech analytics and so on. So, yeah, I think uh, the, the other one which uh, comes to mind is also the physics, uh, laws of physics simulation with uh, uh, AI, which is a breakthrough. And I think in the future, it's uh, like uh, Jensen says in his keynote, 
uh, will help us create digital twins of the earth itself to, you know, for climate, uh, simulating climate uh, changes and so on. So I think, uh, yeah, most of this is around AI. And I think Rama, I think you can mention a few. Um, Tokyo, again, AI applications, right? Tokyo was one of them, uh, which is again, an AI application for uh, taking uh, most of this video, uh, streaming video analytics, speech and all that, and you know, creating digital twins or avatars as, you, as Jensen calls it, of people, uh, real sure. people. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Rupa, you're you're right on the money here, and it's great because we both watch the same GTC, right? So uh, the uh, I think one of the things that Rupa's hitting on here that is incredibly important is that um, when it comes to these uh, AI systems, right? Nvidia is an AI company, so we see a lot. A lot of our answers are coming through that um, AI lens, right? Uh, the uh, the shift that we're talking about is um, a, a, a shift of where that intelligence is going to occur. And so I'd love to talk a little bit about what Tokyo is, right? And it, at GTC, it was basically uh, demonstrated as like a virtual um, cashier or a virtual assistant um, environment, right? And it combines hmm. a lot of different unique AI technologies, right? Um, it includes AI technologies around the rendering of the virtual assistant, natural language processing, mm. recommendation engines, right? Um, inference models. These are all individual AI technologies that, uh, you know, exist as almost entire pillars unto themselves. And they all get brought together in an omniverse deliverable mechanism right, to bring a digital twin, a more realistic, lifelike experience to mm. this virtual engagement model to uh, allow AI to really step in and provide value to uh, a real world experience. And that an example of Tokyo is something as simple as, uh, you know, ordering food, right? Uh, and, and that's what, uh, you know, the GTC talk was, but behind the scenes, all those individual components are being connected together, right? Mm -hmm. And being delivered through that Omniverse platform uh, to create this virtual world interaction model that um, really uh, unlocks a new type of way of interacting with, you know, your clientele. Yeah, I mean, I think, the you know, these are the types of things that are changing, obviously, our, our world as we know it, uh, but it, you know, has to have the infrastructure to back that up and to do it in a way that uh, can respond quickly. And, uh, and so you, you all have listed a number of like real case scenarios that I uh, show how that, you know, is happening. Uh, l let me ask a question about, so when I walk through data centers, uh, you know, we will obviously talk about like density and density to racks and all those different things. And as, as customers over time, data center um, infrastructure customers have maybe increased their density their like physical footprint has gotten smaller at, at times. Um, and so a lot of people have said, well, if that happens, then the data center is going to go away or, you know, the, the footprints will get smaller. I would just love to know your thoughts on that. Um, you know, you all are right in the middle of this. You understand how companies are, are structuring their infrastructure. Uh, and, uh, you know, Rama, maybe we'll start with you. What do you think about that? Yeah, it's, it's actually, a, it's an interesting question, right? Um, the future is always super hard to predict. So um, why don't we talk about current trends that we're seeing? Uh, and, then, and then maybe we can make some uh, you know, uh, conclusions based on that, right? So uh, the first thing I really want to call out is this terminology that um, you know, our CEO Jensen has used historically. And it's really good to frame this conversation. It's this new concept that's known as uh, data center is the new unit of compute. Okay. So what does that, what does that mean? Right. Um, so historically way back in the day, right. Uh, applications, if we start at the application layer, applications would run on a very specific server, right? It'd be a targeted server. If you walk through a physical data center, you could point to that server that's in a rack somewhere and say, that's the web server. And you'd point down lower, that's the app server. You point down lower, yes. that's the data, uh, that's sorry, the database server, right? And yep. each one is a dedicated box that's for that function, okay? Now, what we realized is over time, 
applications have gotten more complex. Um, independent of the application infrastructure itself, you know, the introduction of microservices and containerization and distribution, but like the applications themselves as well have gotten more involved. They require more advanced technology, more advanced hardware to do their tasks, right? But combine all those things together, the applications have gotten complex now that they now require disaggregation. They run mm. across multiple physical nodes in multiple physical racks and sometimes across data centers geographically as well, right? And the uh, and they're really broken down that way. So the data center itself has to, had to evolve and has to evolve to accommodate that, right? So then what does that mean for the underlying hardware components of the data center, right? So instead of now focusing on the number of CPUs on a motherboard or the amount of RAM on your server, right? Um, or the amount of uh, disk drive that you might have, right? Uh, per server, instead of looking at that, we have to step back and look at it in a bigger concept. So instead of looking at it per server or per rack or per row, now you're mm -hmm. looking at it on aggregate per data center, right? And, and what that means is now you can have a mix of different underlying hardware resources to be able to accomplish each of those tasks, okay? So you'll have, say, CPUs for general purpose applications, and then mm -hmm. you'll have GPUs for accelerated and parallel um, uh, processing applications, right? Uh, and then you'll have DPUs, the data processing units for um, accelerating your node-to-node -node or application-to-application -application or microservice-to-microservice -microservice communication, mm -hmm. right? So you have different forms of computational hardware that is going to be leveraged to accommodate all the different applications that you have. And then you're disaggregating that and stepping it up. So you're not focused on as a application developer, oh, I got to make sure that this application runs on this specific server on this rack in this data center. Instead, you want to step that away and just look at it and be like, I just want to deploy it, right? And then allow the data center to be able to just allocate me resources accommodatingly, right? So that's the first level to think about, right? What that allows us to do now is to be much more flexible and fungible with resources, right? Now you can leverage excess resources to different um, applications as they become available. And so you don't have to have that worrisome. Now, one of the great advantages of this as well is now that because you're not in a place where you know, you're locked to having to run this application on this server, you can actually have huge reductions in um, server cost and server sizing, right? So for example, if you had an application that was AI sensitive and doing a lot of AI parallel processing workloads, and you were trying to do that work on a general purpose CPU server, okay? Because you didn't have control. This is the old world, right? You're running your application on a fixed server you are going to require 10 times as many servers to do the same amount of work as one GPU enabled server. So that now allows you to scale down the amount of um, you know, resourcing, hardware, uh, space, cooling, power, right? To do the same amount of work, right? Um, but just on a piece of hardware that's designed specially for it, right? Now, this leads to the next question. Well, will that mean there's going to be less, um, you know, uh, less data center space required overall because now we have less? I don't think so because now yeah. you've unlocked this whole new market that sure. can fully leverage it, right? Just because the car came around, there's less horses required. Did that mean that like we didn't need as many horse trails? No, because now roads are now a thing and now we have parking lots. The amount of space became so much more, right? Because you unlocked a huge market that didn't uh, exist before. So it, it's a little bit tricky to program, but the big takeaway here is that there is incredible amount of cost savings that mm -hmm. can occur because you can scale back and not run your applications on um, hardware resources that weren't really designed for it, right? Which allows you to scale back uh, or increase efficiency so that you don't have to uh, uh, take up valuable real estate with inefficient processing uh, mm -hmm. resources to accomplish the same tasks. Yeah, Reba, what are you seeing on this? I mean, would you, assuming you would have the same thoughts as Rama, but like, what would you add to that? Yeah, I, the same thing I echoed Rama's comments. The only thing I can say is, in addition to that, is 
I think uh, with all the things that we have said uh, about real world simulations and all that, so we are solving different newer problems, right? Newer problems. Yeah. Though the servers are becoming denser, you're putting high compute. Every compute is becoming high performance, but you're, the world is trying to solve bigger problems. And I think data set, that thing is not going to go away. You're just going to have many more GPU servers maybe Right, and the whole idea about applications, architectures moving towards more fungible, more virtualized infrastructure, I think that also has made it possible, like Rama said, to have a distributed data center or architect your, uh, use your data center resources more efficiently. And uh, yeah, that's that's mostly it. I, I think data centers are not gonna go away. It's just that we are creating more interesting problems and more data for, yeah. You know, and with uh, all the edge stuff that we talked about, we are getting more data. We are yeah. finding new ways to collect more data and to process more data and to, um, yeah, build new applications and solve more problems. So I think that trend will continue. Yeah, that's something that we've seen, you know, even like so much of the cloud service providers that are out there and how much they've grown in the midst of what you described, Rama, as like the, the physical space of like more what we would say our enterprise users are getting smaller. The, the bigger cloud service providers are getting larger because those companies are utilizing now like hybrid solutions. And so it's a really fascinating, it's a really fascinating time to be in this, you know, industry as a whole. Um, so Rupa, talk to us about how NVIDIA is, is offering AI solutions to solve some of the challenges that are out there for different companies. Yeah, sure. So um, NVIDIA is like you, you can see from the GTC, recent GTC announcements as well. It The goal is to democratize AI, to make it easier uh, to get AI wherever it is, whether it's edge or deep learning systems, uh, high performance systems and so on. And with every GTC, you see a lot of announcements around how uh, NVIDIA is making uh, AI easier to deploy, right? Deploy and uh, operate. And uh, recent announcements were around, you know, SDKs around many industries, whether it's robotics with Isaac or the drive OS, uh, the autonomous systems and um, Maxine we talked about just now and the avatars and omniverse and Riva for uh, speech AI uh, streaming. And there is always the deep stream uh, SDK, which is for real time video analytics, right? Which is used um, in various industries, whether it's industrial floor or you know traffic management or uh, parking operations, healthcare. Uh, healthcare. There was al already an announcement around uh, Clara Holoscan, which is again an uh, optimized AI solution for healthcare. Um, yeah, and digital twins is another thing uh, which we talked about and. Uh, NVIDIA is a very ecosystem player in these areas. So there are NVIDIA partners that we work with and um, solutions are built around our partners. And even if you see the drive OS, how uh, NVIDIA is trying to uh, provide a autonomous vehicle system solution with their hardware and software that we can partner with partners. Rama, That's do you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, I'd love to just, it, you nailed it, Ruba. Uh, I'd love to give an example of one of the partnerships that we're working on and how it ties back to one of your initial questions here, David, around edge computing, right? So earlier on, I did talk about how Equinix is one of the, you know, uh, edge computing uh, players, right? Again, you know, they, they own a bunch of real estate. Sure. Uh, they have a bunch of servers, a well-known name in the industry, right? So um, we partnered with them to talk, uh, to bring all those solutions that Rupa's talking talking about um, to what we would call edge AI, right? And if you uh, look it up, there's a partnership known as AI Launchpad. It's a partnership between NVIDIA and Equinix to be able to bring all these AI constructs via a hosting provider to the edge itself, right? Mm -hmm. And so what that means is now, instead of each customer having to either buy a ton of GPU servers themselves and then find physical location um, to uh, rack it, cool it, power it, and then deploy all the applications themselves, which could be potentially uh, very capital intensive, especially if you're in an industry which is not tech back, but you want to reap the rewards of these AI solution suites. Now you can use a 
edge deployed model through AI Launchpad to be able to deploy these things in a uh, you know environment that's close to your customer base with all the benefits of GPU accelerated parallel processing AI enabled systems, right? And then what we're seeing with our customers that are doing this is it's not just a, uh, you know, an all-in model of just, oh, I have to go all-in on edge or all-in on on-prem. They're picking and choosing the best solution that's going to fit for them, that it has the highest levels of cost efficiency to return on investment, right? So really, these are mixed hybrid models of taking the solutions Rupa is talking about, right, for natural language processing or mm. autonomous driving training, right, or, um, you know, using AI to reduce data transmission rates when doing video chatting, right, um, doing all of those different components, we're taking those, and then customers are picking and choosing should I run this in the cloud, in a, you know, mm -hmm. in a classic cloud hosted provider? Should I be running this on the edge via a, say, a partnership program like AI Launchpad? Should I be federating this data back locally and building my own data center and keeping this as close to my users as possible, right? And they're picking and choosing whichever one fits based on a lot of economic decisions, things such as um, data gravity. How expensive mm -hmm. is it to send these large amounts of data from the source to say a cloud hosting provider mm -hmm. versus my own data center. Sure. And you know, some cloud hosting providers have asymmetric cost terms of it's easy to send data in, very expensive Hard to, to pull data out, out yeah. right? Yeah. Right. And it's because it benefits them. And so it can get it can get tough, right? And, and if it comes to that, it's more economical to run it local. And then other ones are economical due to latency. If I am, you know, a uh, you know, a, a vendorless retail provider that doesn't have a worldwide presence, but I want to have a worldwide consumer base. Do I want to go and buy physical land in all these places and build my own data centers? Or do I want to partner with a company like Equinix who sure. already has it and then deploy my environments out into each of their data centers, right? So, you know, you pick and choose. Why? Because latency then matters, right? You're talking about milliseconds um, or even up to seconds sometimes of data fidelity of traveling 6,000 miles around the world. And if you don't have to do that, that's really good too. So there's a whole host of features and I'm not even getting into the cost of electricity or land sure. in some of these places, right? Yeah. So yeah. you can pick and choose and you don't have to be an expert. So taking all of these solutions that Rupa was talking about, which are have incredible high levels of application value, right? Like, yeah. oh, I want to do that because it gives me a large amount of cost savings in uh, in sales efficiency or, mm -hmm. or uh, you know, operational efficiency, and then distilling it down to, okay, what do I tactically have to do? Well, I have to deploy it on something somewhere and then figuring out the actual capital and OPEX costs associated sure. with executing this. There's a happy middle ground of finding the best solution of those three, like cloud-hosted, edge or federated on-prem data center. And we're seeing our customers finding a really nice balance of the three, but I think we already gave a bunch of examples. Certain data is just better serviced in certain locations, right? Um, some mm -hmm. stuff has to be processed locally, um, you know, sometimes as close to the actual device as possible, robot, autonomous driving car. Some of it works better on the edge, right? Where mm -hmm. data can be tightly federated down so that only relevant information is transmitted forward, right? And then and then the big hefty computational stuff can be done in centralized data centers, right? So, you know, depending on what industry you're in, you pick and choose one, which of those three models works best for you. Right on. Well, Rama and Rupa, you've given our listeners a lot to think about. And so uh, I just really want to thank you both. Uh, your perspective is really valuable and it's really interesting, like the real time examples that you both gave um, are helpful, you know, for our audience to continue to understand, hey, what is driving the need for, you know, 500,000 square foot data center buildings, you know, in Northern Virginia or Chicago or London or Frankfurt. So um, thank you both for being on. We look forward to uh, getting to do this again soon. Thanks for having us. Yeah, this was Pleasure. great. Yeah, this is great, David. Thank you so much. <laughs>